Hi, this is Dr. Emily Sherning with AR, and I'd like to say hello to all of our friends in Idaho. This forecast is going to complete our state level breakdown for the Northwest region. In Idaho, we've got a slightly different picture than the rest of the region. I'd like to show you here in the NCA that Idaho's natural resource economy is tremendous, the largest proportionally by state. As of 2015, it represented almost $32 billion in revenues, and that's only gone up, and a big proportion of that is agriculture. So when we're talking about Idaho's future, we're talking about the future of our nation's food security. Looking at the outlook for the Northwestern region as a whole, if you've watched that regional forecast, you know that here we're dealing with a big chaos factor. In the Northwest, we're expecting more extreme events more frequently than in the rest of the country. Idaho is facing that additional level of year-to-year -year uncertainty alongside Oregon and Washington. But in Idaho, even more than the other states in the Northwest, we need to know what to expect around the water future. I tried to go pretty deep to get you all the best info I could find about what to expect for Idaho's water outlook. And as we put together all that info, we're gonna need to understand it. We're gonna talk about quite a few different facets of the problem. Those will include changes in summer and winter temperatures and changes in seasonal precipitation patterns. That'll help us understand the projected changes to the snowpack, which just to say it, they're not as dire as you might fear. That'll get us the background we need to talk about the whole water picture. First, let's look at the summer heat. There's a big heat up here, but it's far from the worst total picture we've seen. Here we are looking at the USDA plant hardiness zone map and the colors on this map show the number of days over 86 degrees. This is based on historical data from 1980 to 2009. And we see a lot of the things we'd expect that up in the mountains, it's pretty cool in the summer. And then you have slightly warmer summers as you get into your agricultural areas here on the border with the Palouse and here in this valley where Boise is and a little bit warmer in Idaho Falls, but still a pretty cool summer. Let's see how that's projected to change as we get towards mid-century under the RCP 4.5 scenario, which I think is our most likely climate future. You can check out that video on the channel if you want to learn more. We do see big changes here. This whole valley is warming up. We see notable warming in Idaho Falls, about a dub, a more than a doubling actually of days over 86 a year, almost two months of increased warming. This area around Boise was looking at about 90 days over 86 a year. Now it could be up to 120. And up here on the border with Washington, we are gonna be seeing about another month to two months of warm conditions. That could actually lead to some small areas of increased agricultural productivity if you can get access to water. These warming trends that are predicted down here in central Idaho, we're already aware of them, right? Because Idaho was hit really hard by the pine beetles and they were really powered by heat and drought. So we gotta look at this in the face and see what changes we need to make. As we're talking about heat, having a need for more water. We know that water is a limiting resource. You gotta think differently about it. Boise is already on it. This is some nice news for your state as you think about your future resilience. The city of Boise is already beginning to treat for phosphorus. This is an innovation in water technology that is not being used by states across the nation. They're kind of waiting to see how it falls out, right? By treating for phosphorus, Boise is preventing downstream algal blooms, toxic algal blooms. They have been increasing as the climate warms. Ohio has already had hundreds of thousands of people lose access to their drinking water due to toxic algal blooms. Boise isn't willing to wait and see if downstream water is gonna be fouled. Boise is working to protect Idaho's water from those threats. It's very smart, it's very resilient, but Got to build a bigger picture. Let me get back to work. We're going to take a look at winter lows through the lens of plant hardiness zones. So this is another USDA map. We can see that Idaho up in the mountains, we've got a wide range of cold in the plant hardiness zones, right? Five, four, and three up there in the heart of the mountains. Over here on the border with Washington, we're looking at sixes and sevens. Same thing down in the agricultural valley here by Boise, sixes and sevens, five in Idaho Falls. And let's see what we're looking at under RCP 4.5 as we approach mid-century. The changes here are less dramatic, right? We've got some nice winter stability by and large projected in this valley. Same thing up here in our wheat producing region. And the mountains, we can see that there's very little change in that cold heart of the mountains. The real outlier in terms of relative change is Idaho Falls where we see winter changes that are almost as significant as those summer changes. So if you live here, 
I would be concerned about this area as a hotspot for extreme and potentially dangerous weather events. Overall, I have to say those maps show some notable high elevation cold preservation, much better than we see in many other Western states. And that cold preservation is so crucial for winter sports. And I do have some good news on that front. The federal government is predicting Idaho will hold out longer for skiable winters than Washington or other neighboring states. The cultural, the recreational, the economic benefits of winter sports. Idaho has amongst the best forecasts in the nation for preservation in those high elevation areas. Low elevation areas like Silver Mountain, I know you've already been struggling, but it's tough all over. And many places that are ski destinations today are not gonna make it another 10 or 15 years. So if you are in a high elevation ski community in Idaho, you should see this forecast and see a big opportunity. Your potential for economic growth is tremendous, but we need some more information to really see what's gonna happen with the snowpack. We've got our high and low temperature points for the year, but when we wanna know how that's gonna impact the spring and winter precipitation, how that's gonna impact the growing season. Now, some reason, regions, the National Climate Assessment gives us predicted changes to the growing season down to the week, but we don't have that for the Northwest. However, we can get kind of a peek by checking out what's expected on the Montana side of the mountains. I figure it's better to get some idea than no idea. So go, let's go look over at the NCA here. And we can see here the changes in very hot days and very cool days. Over here in the RCP 4.5 scenario, we're looking at the number of days above 90. Looking at these mountains here on the Montana side, we can see that it's gonna be very elevation dependent, but your high elevation areas will see very little change in the number of hot days. However, this next map, I think it gives us some very important information where the number of days below 28, your number of days where you're gonna get snow instead of rain, even under that reduced emission scenario, RCP 4.5, we expect to see about a month fewer cold days, even in the high elevation areas. And we need to get those emissions down because you can see that in 8.5, we're gonna lose two months of cold and that is gonna take us right out of that snowpack sweet spot. It'll be a big problem. But here, looking at just losing a month of cold is not so bad. We need to look at precipitation. Let's go over to another chart here. I want to show you this is another government resource looking at changes in spring precipitation across the country. And you can see that Idaho is squarely in this cross hatched area where all the models agree increases in spring precipitation are very likely. We can see that this is in sort of the five to 10% area, that it is up in this high elevation area where we might expect some of it to fall as snow. But because of that reduction in the chilly part of the winter, a lot of this increased spring precipitation is forecast to fall as rain. So let's take a minute. The overall water picture, we're looking at big water changes. We are anticipating increased water needs because of that heat, increased water demands across the state. The snowpack is going to decrease because of the warming trends, because of the spring precipitation, which will probably lead to spring flooding. That precipitation falling mostly as rain in the lower elevations is going to contribute to early melting of the snowpack. So there's gonna be a lot of water in the spring and the early summer, and then the stream flows will decrease as we get into the midsummer through fall. That's a big change in stream flow patterns projected for Idaho. Right now, you get your peak stream flows in June or July, right? They're projected to peak in March at mid-century. That's really transformational. That's a huge change to your water patterns. Water storage during that time of plenty in the spring it's going to be totally crucial for your operations throughout the rest of the growing season. And landscapes, ecosystems, and crops that currently rely on surface water, there's no denying it. You're looking at big changes. Scientists who focus in on the water, they think Idaho is looking up to a third reduction in crop productivity. It might not be that bad. They're saying a 32% drop is the upper limit. To give some perspective, there are a lot of parts of the country that are looking at drops in agricultural, but say in the Southeast, we could make some of that up by changing to other crops, hot weather crops like millet 
In Idaho, almost all the projected production drops are related to the water picture. We can't get around that necessarily by growing new crops. And we have to acknowledge that so much of Idaho's agricultural profit and production comes from the dairy and cattle industries. There's no way around a big water shortage in those industries. However, there is hope with land use changes and changes in how we capture that peak flow of water in the spring, we can open up a new future here. We gotta get that peak flow into the groundwater. And in many states, that'd be a big challenge, but Idaho is uniquely blessed in the capacity for groundwater recharge. The whole Snake River system is a perfect aquifer for this sort of major water use change. There's a very close relationship between the surface water and the groundwater, many natural recharge points. We could offset a fair amount of these projected production drops by switching towards an irrigation-based economy. This possibility is brought up in this delightfully hardcore paper. I'm gonna share the link here. I love this paper. It gave me a really thorough breakdown on what is going on, what to be expected in Idaho. They did a great literature review. If you like to go deep, you should check it out. The statistical modeling in here is so tight and the work they did to lay out their factor analysis and data sourcing, so transparent. A big props to Adams, Lowe and Zoo. I love the depth and accessibility of this paper. I have one other water issue to talk about and that is single source water systems. This is an alert for people who are on single source wells in Idaho. If you're on one of these, the feds don't have good data on you like they do for people in say Washington state. You're not gonna get the same level of warning that those folks might about what's going on with your water table. If you're on a single source well, you know that you're vulnerable if the water table drops. As you're getting your household ready, preparing for a resilient future, you wanna know what you're dealing with with your well because you're not in a state where you can expect someone else to do it for you. If your well is older, if your well is shallow, improvements are expensive, but the water table outlook for Idaho is not terrifying, even if it switches over to a high irrigation agriculture economy because of the capacity for continual groundwater recharge. You should consider putting money away, get the pipe deep, improve your odds you can hold out if the state does that likely beneficial shift towards more irrigation-based agriculture. So let's pull this together. From a climate perspective, you're looking at some bigger baseline changes than your neighbors to the west, and you are in that northwestern chaos zone where you have to expect more frequent drought years and more frequent deluge years than other parts of the country. You got to be prepared for the flood in the spring. It's going to be real intense by mid-century. You'll need to store that abundant water that'll come in the spring. And when we're talking about big risks, you already know there's going to be elevated wildfire risk in Idaho until all the dead pine burns out. However, despite these major risks and that transformational change to the water landscape, I don't see this picture as totally grim. Unlike many water limited states, you're looking at a forecast that includes an increase in precipitation and you've got some unusually rechargeable aquifers. And I know that you all are capable of innovation, of serious adaptation to changing conditions. It's not like Idaho is one of those states that used to have a pleasant climate where people are kind of soft. Let's get real. You all are tough. As you prepare for these changing water and temperature conditions by mid-century, I think plenty of you can see there's enough slack in this system to have something to work with. There's some opportunities here. If you want to work in irrigation, that's going to be a growth industry. And recreation, let me tell you, not every state has mountain areas with halfway decent climate stability. Not every state is keeping any potential for winter sports recreation. You have a big potential for increase in the tourism and recreation industries in the northern part of this state. Some of your existing ski communities, higher elevation ski communities, you're being federally recognized as having great outlooks compared to your neighbors all around. Idaho, I'm rooting for you. I hope you can use this information to get ready. Keep those agricultural yield drops as low as possible because I know how much America needs you and the work you all do every day. I'm grateful to you. This is Dr. Sherning with AR signing out. Please like and subscribe. Help get the message out there. There is hope. We can prepare for what's coming. Let's get ready.